Hello. Uh, I'm Susan Hoffenstein, and I am at Penn State University Park in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And in this first slide, you can see me standing next to a giant cryoelectron microscope. So this is the Titan Creos, and we use this microscope to collect data to solve 3D reconstructions. So the project I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, using cryoEM as a structural analysis to understand how canine parvovirus, or CPV, uh, uses the transferrin receptor and how this contributed, contributes to species jumping. So here on this slide, I'm showing the people who did the work. Uh, on the left panel, uh, from left to right, we have Saria, Dan, and Hume Walk. Hume Walk is the one who did all the reconstructions in my lab. On the right panel, from left to right, we have Robert, Ian, and Colin, Colin Parrish's lab is at Cornell, and they uh, collaborated with us on this project. So prior to the late 1970s, there wasn't a version of parvovirus that infected dogs. Um, the first parvoviruses or canine parvoviruses that arose in the late 70s started causing pandemics, and, which means they swept across the world. While we, when we started studying canine parvovirus in collaboration with Colin Parrish's lab, we found that there were mutations uh, between the feline version and the canine version. And originally we thought that the virus must have jumped species from cats to dogs. Since then, we've done more work and found that it's a little more complicated than that. And it seems probably likely that the virus jumped species from cats to raccoons and then to dogs. But we were able to map on the capsid surface the areas, uh, the mutations where the mutations cluster and we're able to deduce that that is where the receptor binds. So as the, uh, through history, as the virus has um, circulated, we've found that it infects quite a number of carnivores. And you see the, the tree on the left that shows the relationship of these different variants of the virus. And on the right, we show uh, a number of canines, and uh, the virus can infect the TFR, transferrin receptors, of all these different species. And doing some binding assays, we found that the transferrin receptor for the blackback jackal, and that's the canine uh, in the center of that group, uh, binds the, the capsid with pretty high affinity. So we picked that for these structural studies. Going into the studies, we have a lot of information about canine parvovirus capsids. There are multiple crystal structures and high-resolution cryo-EM structures from which we can base this work. And there's also some information on the transferrin receptor itself. The Martin Lawrence uh, solved the crystal structure of human TFR shown on the left. And it's made up of three basic domains. Uh, up at the top, it has this, well, overall, it has this sort of butterfly shape. So the tips of the butterfly wings, that's the apical domain. And we know that's the portion that binds to the virus capsid. Then there's sort of a center domain where you see the two uh, wings wrapped together to, to make this butterfly shape. And that's a very stable structure. So this uh, is a dimer, but it's never found as a monomer and solution, we, we typically see it as a very stable dimeric complex. On the right is a structure from Yifan Chang that shows TFR binding its, its natural ligand, which is transferrin. So the transferrin are arranged around the outside of the TFR molecule. Um, so the, they will bind at the, the wing region. And I, I'll show you more about this a little bit later. So this diagram um, shows different species of TFR lined up together. And the things to note here is they are uh, very similar. Um, blue highlights, we show a couple of glycosylation sites for the canine version of TFR. 
And then we know this red site, the site outlined in orange or red there, is a very critical one for virus binding. This project was first started back in 2007, and this very low resolution structure is shown on this slide. Um, that previous work, um, we have a fairly low resolution structure uh, where we show one TFR in the red, green, and yellow, one TFR bound to the virus capsid. It's sort of blobby, but I think the more important things that we learned from this structure was because the TFR molecule is so large relative to the size of the capsid that only a few receptors can bind. It probably can't get more than 20 receptors on a capsid at any one time because they just will crash into each other and prevent binding next to a next door neighbor. Um, we also found that when we worked with the complexes, if we used more than about 10 TFR per capsid, uh, that ratio led to aggregation. So we knew moving forward that we'd have to focus on solving this structure in an asymmetric way. So using our black back jackal purified TFR and purified canine capsids, we made an incubation of about four TFRs per each capsid. Then we vitrified that solution, and the uh, robot for vitrification is shown in the center, and then collected data on using the uh, Titan Creos. This is an image that shows a micrograph. Uh, this is the output from the Titan Creos. So this is a, the complex shown as a 2D projection uh, in a raw microgra micrograph. And the little boxed areas are blown up on the right. And you can see the outline of the capsid and then make out some TFRs bound to it. So we had about almost 4,000 micrographs and we were able to collect uh, 154,000 particles or so from this data set, and we use those for the 3D reconstruction. Even though there's only there, there are about four TFRs per capsid, but the first thing we did was average all over the capsid to get as high resolution as as we possibly could. And when we do that, those few TFRs that are bound sort of just average out. We don't see them, but we get a really nice reconstruction of the capsid alone, and that's what's shown here. Um, to the right is a single uh, structural protein, and we can look at that in comparison with the crystal structures and see that there's no massive or global conformational change induced by the binding of the receptor. But we did see some other change, and that's shown here. So on the left is K9 parvovirus, or CPV, alone. It's never been incubated with receptor. And on the right is the map that I just showed you, but these two maps are rendered differently. So the color code, color code corresponds to flexibility. Anything that's blue and grading toward um, white and red. So the blue is, is very stable and white is much more flexible. And you can see that the capsid alone is very rigid and stable. But after the transferrin receptor has bound, the capsid parts become more flexible or more dynamic, and that's shown on the right. So now if we go back to um, the, the icosahedral map shown here, or the averaged map, um, we want to probe this map and find where the TFRs are bound. So in order to do that, we're going to do a focused uh, refinement, or first we're going to start with a SIMBREAK approach. And I'm going to describe that in the next slide. So the, uh, there's six little maps shown here, and the one that's called INISH, or for initial, is the map we used as a model to start with. So basically, we took a low-resolution model of the transferrin receptor and just stuck it onto the capsid. And we used this as a search model in that icosahedrally averaged map. And so we were searching the map, trying to 
line up and find the locations of the various uh, one to four bound transferrin receptors. So basically we're rotating the map looking for where TFRs are bound relative to the capsid. And the outputs are shown in the first, third, fifth, seventh, and ninth iterations of this process. And this is called a symmetry mismatch approach. And you can see by the ninth iteration that we've sort of aligned all the bound TFRs into the same orientation and sort of piled that density on top of itself to show a single asymmetric map of the virus with TFR bound. So that showed us or, or confirmed for us that the uh, binding event did take place at the tip or that apical domain of the TFR and at the tip of the threefold spike on the virus. We have a very nice high resolution capsid structure. It's near atomic resolution. The receptor density is, is better than our first blobology that I showed you before from 2007, but we're hoping to improve it. The first thing we noticed was there's too much volume for just TFR. Now on the next slide, I'll show you what I mean. So now I show you two views. Uh, the capsid is down below and the TFR density is more in the center. And on the left, you, you see the butterfly turns 90 degrees and see this extra density around it. And in the right view, you can see the butterfly sort of wing on and you see that cluster of density, unfilled density above. Well, we know from Yifan Chang's structure that this is this unfilled density is where TF, transferrin, binds to the transferrin receptor. So our transferrin receptor had TF already associated with it when it bound to the virus. So we went back um, to the purified TFR alone and we did charge detection mass spectrometry. And this showed that an analysis of purified TFR showed that we had free TFR with one TF bound and some with two TF, TF molecules bound. And the peak at the left might be where TFR has dissociated, which is sort of unexpected to us uh, in this complementary um, experiment. So moving forward, now we want to look at the interaction between the receptor and the virus capsid. And when we zoom into this, the, the virus is, on, is below and the TFR is above in green. We can see that at this site of the interaction, the density isn't very good. And so now to the right, we see a map that's rendered according to resolution. Uh, red is good, high resolution, and you can see the capsid is mostly red. But as you start looking at the TFR that's bound there, the resolution quickly becomes quite poor. But now, true, there's only a few TFRs compared to the number of capsids we have, but this isn't anywhere near as good as what we would expect. We would expect it to be a little better. So we continued the analysis. So the first thing we did uh, with this analysis was the focused classification. So that means we masked an area, and we masked off an area corresponding to the TFR volume. And what we found with this first round of focused classification was occupied and unoccupied TFR binding sites. Then with the, uh, we did a second round of focused classification and here we found that there are multiple ways that TFR binds relative to the capsid. So in that volume, the TFR is actually taking on different orientations relative to the capsid. So there's different positions of the TFR adjacent to the capsid. So if we link all of these different orientations together, we actually see that there's movement. So the TFR binds the capsid with a very dynamic movement. It actually rocks in three different directions and there's a slight rotation. 
So in the lab, we started calling this the rock and roll receptor. So the next thing we wanted to do was get the very best um, resolution reconstruction of TFR that we could. So we released it from the context of the capsid and just did a reconstruction on TFR alone. We got to about six angstrom resolution, which is good enough to do the fitting. So what we did here was fit the crystal structure solved by Martin Lawrence into the cryo-EM density. And now we can put it back into the context with the capsid and interpret that interface. And that's shown on the next slide. So this is what we call a road map, and you can just barely see the black triangle that outlines one repeating subunit on the surface of the virus. The outlines show uh, the receptor binding site of TFR on the capsid. So we've changed the terminology since I made this slide because outlined in red are the sites that are consistent between every binding mode as the TFR sort of rocks and rolls on the capsid. So we always have those interactions. The ones outlined in yellow change a little bit as the virus receptor rocks and rolls. Then the two uh, pictures on the right show where the TFR is binding the capsid. So that's the TFR uh, rotated and unrotated to show the interactions of the different amino acids on the, t on the transferrin receptor. So the take-home take message here is that we believe that the variability with which the capsid can interact with TFR is really a driving force for the evolution and explains how this virus can jump species and use different species TFR and still infect a cat, a dog, or a blackback jackal. The last slide is uh, another picture showing acknowledgments from my lab, Colin Parrish's lab, and of course our funding agencies. Um, this ends my talk, but I understand in this format there will be questions, and I'll be glad to follow up with those questions by email.